Well, good morning. Welcome to church service. My name is Newly Spikes, and I'm privileged to get to serve this local body as an elder. Um, I want you to know I'm the oldest elder, and I'm currently the bass, chip, bass fishing champion, okay? <laughs> hey, go ahead and get your Bibles out and turn them to Luke chapter 11. That's where we're going to be today. And while you're opening them up, I'm going to tell you a quick story. Uh, I need to give you a, a little disclaimer about this story is uh, I'm a recovering alcoholic. Um, the Lord in his kindness um, has allowed me to remain completely sober since January 2013. Amen. So when I was 21 years old, 1996, I went to a friend's bachelor party and I drank heavily and then I drove my truck and I fell asleep uh, while driving and I had a terrible accident. Um, my truck uh, flipped end over end over end. Uh, they had to cut me out of it uh, to get out of there. I barely survived. When I woke up, I was in a hospital uh, bed and the first person I saw was uh, a state trooper. And he read me my rights and he gave me a DWI. Um, at that point in my life, all I owned was that truck my Aggie ring, a pair of boots, and a couple of sets of clothes. Like, that was it. And my truck was totaled. Um, this was a pretty big sign that drinking was a problem in my life. The judge found me guilty. He sentenced me to two years probation, 100 hours of community service, um, a battery of... Uh, awareness classes that I had to take. Um, and that, that again should have been a really big sign that drinking was a problem. Over the next two years, I'd go to the probation officer. I'd see him every month. He would test me to see if I'd been using alcohol. He would uh, make sure that I had, was holding down a job and that I was doing my community service work, that I was going to these classes. And uh, he would always warn me that drinking was a problem and that drinking and driving for sure was a problem. And I just didn't believe him. I didn't want to listen to him. I'd go to the classes uh, where they would give great evidence of all the dangers of drinking and, and drinking and driving. And I, I didn't believe him. I, I didn't want to listen to him. And I, I finished um, those, those two years. I, I did everything that they asked me to do, all the classes, all the community service. And I just kept on drinking. In 2012, the Lord took over my life. He plucked me right out of this mess of a life that I was making for myself. And he saved my wife the day before. We're a miracle. And a couple of months after this happened, uh, we went on a date and I ordered both of us a drink. And when the drinks arrived, Karen looked at me and she said, I wish you wouldn't drink that. I said, why? She said, when you drink alcohol, it always makes me feel like I'm having to compete with the alcohol for your attention. I didn't touch that beer. I just left it sitting there and I haven't touched a drink since. Um, the Lord had to, he had to do something in me. He had to give me a new heart for me to be able to believe. And my wife gave me a sign that I then could believe. And I'm telling you all that story today because uh, the text that we're talking about is um, dealing with signs and belief or signs and unbelief. And so uh, if it's your first time with us, I, I wanna let you know that we're teaching through the book of Luke verse by verse. And right now we're in Luke chapter 11, verses 29 through 32. What's been going on, what's happening here in Luke is Jesus is teaching a large crowd. And he had just uh, performed a miracle in the presence of this large crowd where he had cast a demon out of a, out of a man. The demon had caused the man to be mute, unable to speak. And the crowd witnessed it happen. They, they watched the man speak. And today, Jesus, uh, oh, oh, and the, the religious leaders who were Jesus' enemies, the Pharisees and the lawyers, they claimed when they saw that that Jesus was performing his miracles by the power of Satan. 
And so today, we're gonna see Jesus address those religious leaders uh, for their unbelief in him. And so there, there's three things that we're gonna observe today for you note takers. Here they are. Okay, number one, Jesus rebukes unbelieving sign seekers. Number two, Jesus points to himself as the ultimate and final sign. And number three, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection demands belief and repentance. So let's read the scripture and then I'll pray and then we'll jump right in. Luke 11, nine. Luke 11, 29 through 32. As the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign. And yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so will the son of man be to this generation. The queen of the south will rise up with the men of this generation at the judgment and condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Well, God, I just praise you for your word. Um, I praise you that you have uh, written it for us, that you've uh, kept it for us, that's available for us. I praise you for this time that we have together this morning to study your word. Uh, I just pray that you would help us all to put aside everything else that's going on in our mind and our life and just focus on you and your word for uh, some minutes together this morning that you would teach us and you would impact us. Uh, we can go away from here uh, better, closer to you and more like Jesus because of your word, God. I pray that you help me to uh, deliver this message faithfully, uh, that it can be heard. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, point number one, Jesus rebukes unbelieving sign seekers. Look at verse 29. Here's how it goes. As the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign. What a way to start a message. <laughs> Think about it. What if I had come up here today and I'd have said, what a great group of gossips y'all are. <laughs> or what if I'd have said, uh, would you look at this collection of covetous we have here today? Right? Or good morning, you crowd of control freaks. Right? <laughs> y'all, wow. It's clear that Jesus is rebuking his audience. And, and here's why I think Jesus is trying to start this way. He's got something really important that he wants to get across. He's trying to get the attention of the hard-hearted that are in his crowd. They're hard-hearted because they chose not to believe in him as the Messiah. Even after he had taught them with the authority from heaven, and even after he had, they'd witnessed him perform miracles in their sight, he knew that there were hard-hearted folks in his crowd because immediately after he had performed the miracle of casting the demon out of the mute man, they asked him for another sign. Look at Luke uh, 11 verses 15 and 16, it says, but some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Others, to test him, were demanding of him a sign from heaven. So Jesus tells them that they're an evil generation. Then he tells them why they're evil, because they seek a sign. So there's two things that I want us to look at in this first verse so that we can understand it. The first is, what does he mean by generation? And the second one is, why are they evil for seeking a sign? So let's look at the generation first. This is not the only place where Jesus responds to the crowd, which included his enemies, the religious leaders, in this way. In Matthew 12, 38 to 39, he, it says, then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign. And then in Mark 8, 11 and 12, it says the Pharisees came out and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him, sighing deeply in his spirit. He said, why does this generation seek for a sign? Well, the Greek word that's used here for generation is genia, 
And it refers to the culture that the people lived in. And both Jesus and John the Baptist used this word in the New Testament to describe people with the same beliefs. So Jesus is not talking about all the people that were alive at the time as the generation. He's Rather, he's talking about the people who share the same beliefs or in this situation specifically, unbelief, which is what we're gonna talk about next. So let's look at sign seeking. Why did their sign seeking cause him to call them evil, wicked, and adulterous? I'm gonna give you the short answer and then I'm gonna explain it. The short answer is this. Their sign seeking was a symptom of unbelief in him as the Messiah. And unbelief in Jesus Christ is evil and wicked. And for those who are God's chosen people, the Jews, unbelief in Jesus was adulterous. It was adulterous because they turned away from their first love, which was God, and turned to their man-made rules and traditions. So how's sign-seeking a symbol of unbelief? We gotta talk about signs for just a minute. Uh, there's a simple definition of signs that I looked up online. It says a gesture or action used to convey information or instructions. Y'all know what signs are, right? Right? Everybody does. We're surrounded by them all the time. I'll give you a test. I bet you're going to pass, okay? Here's a sign. A red octagon. Yes, y'all are smart. Uh, a green light. Go. A red and white chicken head. Chick-fil-A. Somebody, like, the moms were like, Chick-fil-A. No. A green mermaid. Starbucks, yes. Okay. Golden Arches, McDonald's. Yeah, we know these guys. Y'all are good. Okay, there's also signs where when we see something, it indicates that something else is going on. If you're a deer hunter, okay, in the last week or so, you've probably noticed the activity of the bucks that tells you that the rut is on in North Texas. Amen? Yes. Uh, body language is a sign, right, uh, that tells us what's going on in our physical setting. Uh, we don't even have to teach this. I've got an 18-month-old baby, Glory, and she will watch my face in a new situation to see how I react. And the way I respond determines how she feels about something. Signs universally serve humanity as tools of communication. They tell people something. We are all sign seekers, and we seek signs with different motives. You... You might see the golden arches with a motive to find a better option. <laughs> I see the golden arches as a beacon of Happy Meal value for a family of nine, okay? Different motive. So all those signs are a basic human communication tool. The motive we have when seeking them points to either helpfulness or danger. Okay, so a healthy example is you, you may uh, request your credit score as a sign uh, because you're trying to buy a house and then you do the work to try to improve your credit score so that you can get a loan and buy a house. And that would be helpful to you and your family, this seeking of this sign. I've got a story in my life to illustrate a dangerous, a dangerous heart motive for seeking a sign. When uh, my wife, Karen, was pregnant with our second son, Grady, we had a 19-week ultrasound. And the results of the ultrasound showed that our baby had something called an EIF. I'm gonna have to read this to you. It's an echogenic intercardiac focus. The doctors informed us, that, informed us that the condition is generally harmless, but it could possibly be a sign for genetic abnormalities. Well, their plan was for us to come back in 10 weeks and they were gonna perform a specialized, a different ultrasound called a 4D ultrasound with a perinatologist who would closely examine our baby from head to toe, looking for all signs that might point to genetic abnormality, specifically Down syndrome. Those 10 weeks were awful for Karen and I. Uh, we played out every scenario of what it might look like to have a child with special needs. We lived in fear for those 10 weeks. 
And I should point out here that at this time in our lives, Karen and I weren't Christians. Well, at the next ultrasound, the doctor spent nearly two hours measuring and scanning and for all these signs. She shared the results. She showed us every detail, every measurement of every bone. She showed us images of all the areas that could be signs of Down syndrome. And she concluded confidently for us that our baby was a normal, typically developing child. Well, 10 weeks later, when Grady was born and the doctor held him up, it was beautifully clear that he had Down syndrome. So what was this tiny little sign, this tiny little image on a doctor's specialized computer? What was it that caused such fear in our hearts for those 10 weeks? That tiny little sign was an attack on our hopes. It was an attack on our ability to control our lives and our family. It got in the way of our personal plans. It threatened the dreams of what we thought our family and life would look like. We questioned the doctor. We questioned the ultrasound machine. We questioned everything. Well, six months later, we found out we were pregnant with our third son. His name's Judd. We signed up for every test. We wanted every measure taken. We wanted every sign that would give us assurance that this child would be typically developing. And our motive for seeking those signs during our pregnancy with Judd was one of control. We were trying to control our own comfort, our own joy. We let the outcome of tests and signs determine our joy, determine our happiness. Guys, here's the reality. Grady was born with Down syndrome. And then Judd and four more after him were all born typically developing babies. God knew exactly what he was doing when he gave us Grady. He's been such a blessing to our family. He's probably been a blessing to many of you that's in the, that are in this room. As bad as we wanted to control, God was in control every second of every one of those situations. And no amount of testing or signs would have changed any detail. So let's look specifically at the signs that the religious leaders were seeking in our text today. They were seeking miracles. Look at verse 16. It says, others to test him were demanding a sign from heaven. Gotquestions.org provides the definition of a miracle as, a miracle is an event that involves the direct and powerful action of God, transcending the ordinary laws of nature and defying common expectations of behavior. Miracles are extraordinary occurrences that can only be attributed to the supernatural work of God and demonstrate his involvement in human history. God employs miracles in the Bible to reveal himself, his character, and his purposes to humans through phenomena that are not otherwise explainable. That's a mouthful. So if signs and miracles are a part of God's plan, why did Jesus deem the Pharisees and the lawyers evil, wicked, and adulterous for seeking them? The answer is in their motive, the motive for why they were seeking the signs. And scripture provides us some reasons why people seek signs. Uh, and, and, and in looking at these reasons, people see signs, we, we can determine the difference between a righteous way to seek signs and an evil way. So let's look at that now. Righteous sign seeking involves a desire to receive confirmation from the truth of God. A couple of illustrations for that. Moses. In Exodus 3, Moses is talking to God at a burning bush. The bush itself, while burning and not being consumed, was a sign from God to Moses that it was God that he was speaking with. And then Moses asked God, he said, what if, I'm sorry, God asked Moses, he said, I want you to go back to Egypt and gather the elders, and I want you to lead my people out of Egypt, lead them out of slavery. And Moses says, what if they won't believe me? What if they won't listen to me? So God empowers Moses with three miracles. He gives him the ability to take his staff and throw it on the ground and turn it to a snake and then pick it up and turn it back into a staff. He gives him the ability to take his hand, put it in his shirt and make it turn leprous white and then reverse it by putting it back into his shirt. And last, he gives him the ability to take water from the river, the Nile River, and pour it on the ground and make it turn into blood. So God performed a miracle to confirm to Moses who he was speaking with, and then he empowered Moses to perform miracles to confirm to the elders in Pharaoh 
that the message he was bringing was from God. Another example is Gideon from Judges. The Lord asked Gideon, instructed Gideon to go take the people and conquer the Midianites. And Gideon uh, asked God if he could prove that it was him giving him the message. Uh, he put God to the test. He, he asked him to show him a sign twice using a wool fleece. First, he asked God if he could put the fleece on the floor and then overnight have the fleece be wet with dew and the floor be dry, right? A miracle from God, and he did it. And then, then Gideon said, now reverse it. Okay, this time I'm gonna put the fleece on the floor and I want it to be dry and I want the floor to be wet. And God did it. Um, God performed both these signs to confirm to Gideon who he was and to confirm the message that he was giving him. This type of sign seeking comes from a heart that wants to hear God and follow him. How these two men responded after they received the signs from God pointed to their righteous motives. Look at them. Moses went back to Egypt and led the people out. Gideon followed God's instructions and conquered, conquered the Midianites. Church, God doesn't owe us a sign. His attributes merit our belief in him. He is worthy of our faith. Which scripture tells us in Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We're blessed by God to believe without seeing. Look at John 20. 29. Here, Jesus is speaking to Thomas. Remember that Thomas is the disciple of Jesus who uh, doubted the resurrection uh, until he was able to touch Jesus' uh, crucifixion wounds. And in John 20, 29, Jesus says to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. This is the message I wanna get across to you here, is that our faith in Jesus in its richest density exists without the proof of seeing. At the same time, though, God has given us signs out of his great love for us to confirm himself, his character, and his purpose. But there's a danger in continually relying on signs for our belief. If signs are the basis of our belief, then we're really worshiping the sign and not the one in which the sign points to, which is God. And if we're worshiping signs rather than an all-powerful God, we're going to grow an appetite for greater and greater signs in order to fuel our faith. And last, there's the danger of us uh, seeing and believing false signs. Scripture, scripture warns that, that even the elect can be fooled by the signs from the enemy. Look at Matthew 24, 24. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and even show signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Okay, so we just covered righteous sign seeking. You guys with me? Now let's look at evil sign seeking. This group of people, evil sign seekers, are, they're seeking a sign because they don't believe. They don't believe the miracles that they've seen. They don't believe the signs uh, that have already been performed and or they want to test uh, the sign giver. This is exactly the situation with the lawyers and the Pharisees in our text today. Uh, they were aware of, or they'd personally witnessed many of the miracles that Jesus had already performed. Many of those signs were direct fulfillments of the Old Testament, Old Testament prophecy about the Messiah, which, which they were experts on. He'd given sight to the blind. He'd given hearing to the deaf. He'd healed the legs of a man crippled for 38 years. He'd given words to the mute. Look at Isaiah 35, five and six. Prophecy about the Messiah. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. The lawyers and Pharisees, this evil generation he's speaking to, their hearts were hardened. They didn't wanna believe it didn't matter what miracle Jesus would have performed. They were determined not, not, to, not to believe. And this willful unbelief is what Jesus called wicked and evil. They were the worst kind of evil. They'd dug their heels in against believing in Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. Now, if you're paying attention right now, which I'm sure some of you are, 
Uh, some of you might be going, whew, okay. He just landed, okay. I see why Jesus is calling evil here. Uh, he's calling these guys evil because they hated him and they, were, and they willfully did not believe in him. I don't hate Jesus. I love Jesus. I believe in him as my savior. I'm off the hook here, preacher man, right? Uh, that's what some of us might be thinking. Church, I want you to listen to me real closely right now. Unbelief in Jesus Christ in any way is sin. Unbelief in Jesus Christ is evil. For those of us that have a relationship with him, who believe in him, who've been saved by him, we are believers. But we can find ourselves at times not believing. Believers who are not believing. We may not be an evil generation with, that are hard-hearted towards Jesus, uh, but we can certainly go through periods of personal unbelief. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do you ever doubt? Do you ever have doubts about God? I do. His path, why is he doing what's he doing in my life? I do. Doubt is unbelief. How about this one? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be equipped, adequate, equipped for every good work. Have you ever struggled to believe something in scripture? I have. Have you ever bent scripture, bent God's word toward an interpretation that would support your own desires? Yeah, I, I have. Disobedience is unbelief. How about this one? Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Do you ever struggle to forgive or hold on to unforgiveness for too long? I do. Unforgiveness is unbelief. Do y'all want me to keep going? <laughs> I, I was, that was the end anyway, I was kidding. But we could go on and on though, right? There's a story in Mark 9 where uh, there's a father of a, of a boy who's a demon possessed in, in the worst way. And uh, he's desperately seeking for Jesus to help him uh, with his demon possessed uh, son. And Mark 9, 24 says, immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe Help my unbelief. As Christians, we still have a sinful flesh. We're, we're still inadequate. We're in continual need of God's grace and God's spirit. And even in the face of that, and even in the, the face of the willful unbelievers that Jesus was facing in our text today, he says that there's an answer. There's an answer coming that's the remedy for all this unbelief. And that's what we're gonna, we're gonna, my second point is now, Jesus is the ultimate and final sign. Look at verse 29 and 30. And yet no sign will be given to it, but the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so will the son of man be to this generation. First thing we're gonna look at here is what is the sign of Jonah? If you look at Jesus's response to the lawyers and Pharisees in Matthew 12, he answers that exact question. Here it is, Matthew 12, 39 and 40. It says, but he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Well, you probably remember the story of Jonah. Okay, Jonah was a Jewish prophet of God and the word of God came to Jonah. God uh, told Jonah to go and preach to the Assyrians whose capital city was Nineveh. Jonah didn't wanna listen to God because he did not want God to save the Assyrians because the Assyrians were terrible people and they were the enemy of Jonah and the Israelites. The Assyrians were a ruthless warrior nation. 
uh, who had no mercy on their enemies. They were known for extreme torture of their captives. There are stories of entire cities committing suicide rather than face being captured by the, Assyri the Assyrians. They were that bad. And so Jonah deliberately disobeyed God and he went to the port of Joppa and boarded a ship sailing the opposite direction of Nineveh where God asked him to go. He got on a ship sailing to Tarshish, which was the farthest destination that he could find from Nineveh. But God is all-knowing. He knew where Jonah was the whole time. So God sent a great storm on the sea that put the entire ship at risk of death and peril. And when this happened, Jonah began to tell the truth and tell the people that were on the ship who he was and what he had done. And then he volunteered to have himself thrown overboard in order to stop the, the storm and save everybody else on the ship. So they obliged and tossed him over into the sea, okay? And when he, hit, when he went into the water... Uh, a great fish swallowed him. And when he was in the belly of that great fish, he repented, he prayed for God's mercy on him. And what we're told next is that um, the great fish spit him out. And then Jonah proceeded to Nineveh to preach to the Assyrians. God had given him a really simple message. He walked through the city of Nineveh preaching that very simple message. Here it is, Jonah 3, 4. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk and he cried out and said, Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Over and over and over. And how did the Ninevites respond? They, were, they believed God's message. A message sent by a hostile, unwilling, unwilling messenger. But God used the miracle that he just performed in Jonah's life to validate that it was God that had sent the message. So Jesus is drawing a parallel between Jonah being swallowed by a great fish and being in the belly of that great fish for three days uh, to Jesus coming death, burial, and resurrection. But Jesus was far greater than Jonah. And he says so himself, drop down to verse 32. He says, behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Jonah was a prophet who received a message from God. Jesus is God. He authored the message. Jonah hated the Ninevites, the Assyrians. Jesus loves sinners. Jonah ran from God and his mission. Jesus resolved to go to the cross and complete his mission. Jonah was figuratively raised from the dead by surviving inside the belly of the great fish. Jesus was physically raised from the dead after being murdered on a torturous Roman cross. Jonah's sign brought salvation to a specific sinful nation Jesus' sign is the gospel, the good news of salvation through his death, burial, and resurrection for all people. Jesus' resurrection from the dead is the greatest and final sign. Friends, Jesus is alive. Amen? He conquered death. He resurrected from the grave. He's not in that tomb. The resurrection accomplished so many things. The resurrection demonstrated that he was the son of God. The resurrection proves that there's more to this world than just this world. There's an eternal life. The resurrection's evidence that Christianity is true. The re resurrection proves that believers will overcome death. The resurrection helps us grieve differently when we lose one our loved ones. The resurrection enables our resurrection. The resurrection guarantees that we'll have an imperishable glorified body. The resurrection means Jesus intercedes for us. The resurrection motivates us to put away sin and live holy lives. No greater sign has ever been performed and no greater sign will ever be performed than Jesus' resurrection. It's the central message of the gospel. And that's what Jesus was pointing to in the verses that we're reading today. That gospel message that he's pointing to demonstrates an amazing grace that it was even available to the wicked and adulterous generation. He was still willing to share that news with them knowing that only some of them would eventually receive him. What a gracious God we have. Point number three. Jesus' death and resurrection demand the response of belief and repentance. The gospel 
the good news of salvation through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is a unique story. It's unique because when we hear it, we realize we're part of the story. And when we understand the story, we realize that the story demands a response from us because the story teaches us that everyone who believes that Jesus died and rose again will inherit eternal life. What will we do with Jesus Christ? There's only two options, believe or not believe. Now we might wanna do some hair splitting here, you know, and add some other options like stall, okay? Or add the gospel to some other belief that we have or pretend we believe uh, by learning the, the words and the right ways to act. But let's just be real. All those are not belief, okay? Jesus is confronting the lawyers and Pharisees in our passage today with this exact same question. What will you do with Jesus? He's telling them that they've been presented with enough evidence to know that he is the Messiah. And their rejection will bring them judgment. And he's teaching them and he's teaching us right now what the proper response to being presented with the good news of Jesus Christ should look like. Step one, hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Step two, believe. Step three, repent. And he used two illustrations in our text to make that point. The queen of the south and the Ninevites. So let's look first at the queen of the south. In scripture, uh, where we're gonna read, she's the queen of Sheba. It says in verse 31, the queen of the south will rise up with the men of this generation at the judgment and condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Okay, this story is in 1 Kings 10, and I'm just gonna read it to you. Um, follow along with me. I'll jump some of the verses. Now, when the, queen of the, when the queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with difficult questions. Verse four, when the queen of Sheba perceived all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his servants, the attendance of his waiters and their attire, his cupbearers and his stairway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there, were, there was no more spirit in her. Then she said to the king, it was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. Nevertheless, I did not believe the reports until I came and my eyes have seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. You exceed in wisdom and prosperity the report which I heard. This should, verse eight, she says, blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you to set you on the throne of Israel because the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore, he made you king to do justice and righteousness. Jesus used the queen of Sheba as an example of belief because she came to hear. She was intrigued by a rumor she had heard. She responded with action. She sacrificed much time and expense to travel a great distance. She tested the source with an open mind. She thoroughly asked questions until the unbelieving spirit inside her was quieted. She sought the truth sincerely and she responded in belief. These lawyers and Pharisees, they had the wisdom of Solomon documented. They knew the Old Testament scripture better than anyone. Plus, they, had the, they were in the presence of Jesus, whose wisdom is greater than Solomon's, and they still didn't believe. And he's saying to them, when you are judged and you cry, but we weren't provided enough wisdom to believe, Lord, that the queen of Sheba will rise up and say, objection. I believed with far less wisdom than they were given. Church, we have direct access to the very wisdom of Jesus that is far greater than Solomon. We have the wisdom of Jesus documented in scripture. What a grace from God that he's given us his full wisdom in scripture. You know, as I was preparing this, it reminded me of 
a young man named Braden who was baptized in the nine o'clock service last week, if any of y'all were here, he shared his testimony. He uh, grew up in a believing home and when he got a phone, he became, uh, he first got access to the internet and he started to see that there were people in this world that have views about God different uh, than him, views that don't believe in God. And as he started to observe them, it actually started to make him question what he believed. And then he shared that he, you know, pursued to understand what he believed through God's word. And God used his word to draw him to himself and save him. What an what a awesome story that is. Friends, God has given us every piece of wisdom we could ever need for our salvation and our sanctification. And Jesus' resurrection from the dead validates every piece of that wisdom. And like the evil generation that Jesus is directly addressing in our passage today, when we are not believing, we don't have an information problem. We have a heart problem. Well, let's keep going. Jesus also teaches that his death, burial, and resurrection demand the response of, of repentance. And he used the Ninevites to illustrate his point. Verse 32, the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. But we already talked about Jonah's simple message from God, and we already noted that the Ninevites repented, but let's look at exactly how they repented. This is Jonah 3, verses five through 10. When the people of Nineveh believed in God, they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself in sackcloth and sat in ashes. He issued a proclamation and it said, in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd or flock taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from his violence, which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning, concerning the calamity which we had, he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. In our text today, in Luke 11, 29 through 32, Jesus is saying, look how these Gentiles, these Ninevites, who didn't even know God, responded with such full and genuine repentance. These guys made radical changes in their lives when they believed Jonah's message from God. Every person from top to bottom and every kind of animal put on super itchy clothes and sat in ashes and fasted from food and water. These, these Ninevites served as an example of biblical repentance, which is a change of mind resulting in a change of action. They believed the message of God sent through Jonah and they turned away from their violent ways and turned towards God. And Jesus is telling this wicked generation that when they are judged and they cry, we didn't get a chance to repent, the Ninevites will stand and they'll serve as an example of a people who repented with far less evidence. In summary, from Luke 11, 29 through 32, we've observed these three things. Number one, Jesus rebukes unbelieving sign seekers. Number two, Jesus is the ultimate and final sign. And number three, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection demand belief and repentance. So what do we do with all this? Well, there's only two kinds of people in this room. Those that have trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior and those who haven't. And for those who haven't, um, I hope you hear this message today and see a God so full of grace and so full of mercy that he, he would even offer his son as a sacrifice and a path to salvation to his enemies. I hope you see that all the kindness and wisdom of God was fully present in Jesus and fully validated in his resurrection. 
And I hope you would open your heart to hear like the Queen of Sheba, knowing that he'll welcome your earnest testing. And I, along with the other believers in this room, will pray that God will move into your life with his power and take over, leading you to respond with belief and repentance. For everyone here that has trusted Christ as their Lord and Savior, this message serves as a reminder to us. We're reminded that we're still gonna struggle with not believing and that our gracious God constantly holds us in a place of forgiveness. He patiently waits for us to remember the gospel message and apply it to our lives again, to believe that Jesus is our savior, our peace, our identity, our hope, our advocate, our joy, our only sign we need, and repent of our specific area of unbelief and get back in stride with him as we walk through life. And I'm gonna give us some very specific instructions on how to do this. I want you to get together with your community, your circle of Christian community. That may be your community group, it may be your region step group, maybe your re-engage close group, maybe the small group uh, study from equipping, it may be wherever your circle of Christian community is, I want you to get together with them and I want you to think about the areas where you have not believed and I want you to confess them to them. I want you to tell them out loud specifically how you have not believed. Then those people that you confess to are gonna stop right then and there and they're gonna pray for you. And then those people that prayed for you, they're gonna speak out loud to you the truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's God incarnate, born as a baby to a peasant virgin. He lived a sinless life so that he could willingly give up his life as a perfect sacrifice for your sins. He allowed himself to be murdered on a brutal Roman cross. He was buried in a tomb. Three days later, he rose from the dead. He appeared to over 500 people after his resurrection. He then ascended into heaven where he now sits at the right hand of God. He's alive and he intercedes on our behalf and yours as a believer. And then those same people who prayed for you and shared the gospel with you, they're gonna tell you how the truths of the gospel apply to your unbelief right now. And you're gonna take it in and you're gonna be refreshed in your belief. And your refreshed belief is gonna lead you to radical repentance, which those people are gonna help you stay accountable to. And then you're gonna get into, right back into a believing and abiding relationship with Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. God, we praise you that you're so gracious, so loving, that you hold out this amazing offer of forgiveness, your amazing grace to even your enemies. God, help us to remember, help us to keep front of mind how desperately we need to continually remember and apply that truth in our lives as we continue to not believe. I just thank you that you're a God of pursuit. How you pursued me, how you pursued our friends in this room and how you're pursuing some now. And let's pray that they come and hear and test and that you would invade their lives, God. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.